everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome to St. John's where whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Hello to everyone online and please stand and worship with us. and amen. Can we get one more round of applause here and online for what I consider to be the very best worship band in the city of Columbus. If you are new to St. John's, you may not know that we are the church where you will find progressive theology, prophetic messaging paired with contemporary music. This is a wonderful place to be because as our church members know, our faith may be 2,000 years old, but our thinking is not. So I'm gonna invite everyone to join us in saying that. Our faith may be 2,000 years old, but our thinking is not. And that's really the place where we're gonna find ourselves today as we enter into a post-resurrection appearance by Jesus and some unfinished business that was left behind. How many of you have some unfinished business in your lives or things that have been kind of waiting until this pandemic reached a different point? I see some hands. I won't ask you all to raise your hands. But 
We have a wonderful message today, some wonderful music, and we are also going to be celebrating communion today as we do on the first Sunday of every month. Now, during the summer, we have a more abbreviated communion litany, but today, for those of you who are new to our tradition, we are going to do the full United Church of Christ litany for communion, and I hope that you will sink into every single word as we are now in Eastertide, the season post-Easter between now and Pentecost. So we start every worship service by warmly greeting one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please greet one another with the peace of God and words of welcome. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Brothers and sisters, if you lift your net and it is empty, come here. We'll cast it out again to Christ's abundance. If you open your eyes but do not recognize the Holy One, come here. We'll find the risen Christ in all creation. If your life is filled with mourning, come here. Christ is leaving a dance of joy Come here, sisters and brothers, to give blessing and honor and glory to God. Let no one call in sin, remain inside the light of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon.
but you may be seated. The Hebrew Bible reading is from the book of Psalms, the 30th chapter. It can be found on page 511 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bible. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried for you to help and you have helped me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you had established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. You know, we don't usually applaud after scripture, but would you all please give Ben a round of applause? He's one of our young readers, one of our young members, and we want to honor the courage that it takes to get up here and see all of you looking at us. I'm used to it, but you know, if you only read every once in a while, right, it can be a little nerve wracking. So he did a fantastic job. I want to thank Ben for leading us today as our liturgist. Our gospel reading on this third Sunday of Easter comes from the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 19. This is quite a long passage, so I'm only going to read certain verses. There's a lot to be unpacked in this, and I encourage you to read the scripture yourselves this afternoon or this evening as part of your own spiritual discipline. But I'm just going to focus on a few things for today's message. I want to set the stage for you. Remember, we're only a couple of weeks past Easter. This is one of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. And many of you have told me that you didn't realize that Jesus came back again and again and again. He didn't just rise on Easter Sunday. He kept coming back to teach before his ascension into heaven. Hear what John has to say about one of these post-resurrection appearances. John writes, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Now, they then saw, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, they then saw Jesus on the beach, and Peter jumped in the water and swam to shore. When they had all come back ashore, it says in verse nine, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And then in verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, You know that I love you. Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to Simon Peter the third time, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to Jesus the third time, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And at the end of the passage, at the very end of verse 19, after all of this, Jesus said to the disciples and to Peter, follow me. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this long and complex passage. Good morning. Good morning, friends at home and some friends who are with us today. So the last book I read was Anti-Racist Baby, recently banned in Florida. And I was thinking, I've been thinking about that since I read that. I was like, you know what? That was really cool. And we should do that more often. So I'm kind of developing a collection now <laughs> of banned books that I thought we should read. So this one is Everywhere Babies. It was recently published. Um, it was initially reported banned by a school board in Florida. However, I've since learned that was a false report. However, it's on a list to be considered, which was good enough for me. So if you don't know what the word banned means, it means that somewhere, somewhere, people in power don't like what's in a book or a record or something, or TV show, I guess. They disagree with it, and they don't want anybody to see it. So make no mistake, information's power, knowledge is power. We make our own decisions about what we read, what we follow, what we listen to. And it's really important in a democracy, I believe. So this is Everywhere Babies, the sweetest little thing you'll ever read, really. Pictures are on the screen. Every day, everywhere, babies are born. Fat babies, thin babies, small babies, tall babies, winter and spring babies, summer and fall babies. Every day, everywhere, babies are kissed on their cheeks, on their ears, on their fingers, on their toes, on the top of their head, on their tummy, and on their nose. Every day, everywhere, babies are dressed in diapers and t-shirts, in buntings and sleepers, in play suits and dresses, in sweaters and creepers. Every day, everywhere, babies are fed by bottle, by breast, with cups and with spoons, with milk and then cereal, carrots and prunes. My babies, never fans of prunes. They spit them out right back at me. That's not funny. Every day, everywhere, babies are rocked. In cradles, in chairs, at nap time, at night, by friends and relatives who cuddle them tight. Every day, everywhere, babies are carried in backpacks, in front packs, in slings and in strollers, in car seats, in bike seats, and on daddy's shoulders. Every day, everywhere, babies make noise. They cry and they squeal, they giggle, they coo, they bang and they splash, and they clap their hands too. Every day, everywhere, babies like toys. Rattles and tops and books that won't tear. Old pots and pans and a fuzzy brown bear. Every day, everywhere, babies play games. Peekaboo, pat a cake, this little piggy. Roll the ball, ride a horse, jiggity jiggy. Every day, everywhere, babies make friends. With a puppy, with a kitten, a goldfish, a bunny, with young people, old people, anyone funny. Every day, everywhere, babies are crawling, forward and backward, on bottoms and knees, upstairs and downstairs, wherever they please. Every day, everywhere, babies are walking. One step, another, they fall down and then pick themselves up and try it again. Every day, Everywhere, babies are growing, 
They can run, they can jump, they can slide, they can swing, they can dig, they can climb, they can talk, they can sing. Every day, everywhere, babies are loved for trying so hard, for traveling so far, for being so wonderful just as they are. The end. So I'll knock this one off the list. Check it as red. I have it in my office. I believe the opposition was to the illustrations, which are kind of interesting, a little hard to, to get on the screen because they're kind of intricate. So feel free to come look at it sometime. Let's pray. Oh, we need to pray. One, two, three. Dear God, thank you for babies who love us no matter what and who remind us that you love us no matter what. Help us to love others, no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, who's coming to Holy Moly?
Amen and amen. Thank you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning. I know some of you are baseball fans. We're getting ready to start kickball tomorrow night. By the way, sign up. We've got uh, a couple of our kickball folks are here. Um, We have a spring season and a summer season, and it's a lot of fun to to play intramural sports um, together as a church. But I know some of you are baseball fans. We don't yet have, I should say yet have, a church baseball team. How many of you are baseball fans? Yeah, I've got some big baseball fans. Well, how many of you baseball fans have heard of a man named Fred Snodgrass? Fred Snodgrass, if you've never heard of him, made one big mistake in his life, and the world never let him forget it, literally. Snodgrass was playing center field for the New York Giants in 1912, It was the 1912 World Series between the New York Giants and the Red Sox. The teams were tied in the 10th inning when a fly ball fell into Snodgrass's mitt and he dropped it. The Red Sox then won the World Series and that error stuck with Mr. Snodgrass for the rest of his life. 62 years later, Married with two children and five grandchildren, this man's New York Times obituary read, Fred Snodgrass, 86, dead. Ball player, muffed 1912 World Series flyball. That's what his obituary said 62 years after the one mistake that defined his life. Can you imagine being defined by your biggest mistake for the rest of your life. Can you imagine? And I offer this because that's, that might be the way that we remembered Simon Peter 2,000 years after the scripture that I just read and all of the scriptures leading up to that, to Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and post-resurrection appearances. Can you imagine if we remembered Simon Peter 2,000 years later and remembered him for his one big mistake in life? Something like Simon Peter, fisherman, denied the Lord Jesus Christ in 33 AD, not once, but three times. Do you remember that? He denied Christ as he went to the cross. Well, that's where Peter's story would have ended if the risen Christ had not shown up in today's gospel story to teach us that no event in your life can imprison you. No event in your life can imprison you. Put that on your fridge. Put that in your phone. Put it wherever you see your daily reminders. Because that's what the resurrection is all about. No event in your life can imprison you. Then and now. I mean, most of us would not want to be defined by our biggest mistake in life. And yet, too oftenly, too often, our mistakes and more importantly, our shame about those mistakes hold us back in life. Have you ever experienced that kind of shame? I mean, last week, Elena one of our members in discernment for ordination in the United Church of Christ, she spoke eloquently about doubt and trauma and shame. But the good news is that this week's passage is about the fact that Jesus does not leave us there. Jesus shows us the way through grace, redemption, and ultimately resurrection over and over again until we find healing 
and peace. But how many of you have experienced the kind of shame that Peter must have felt? The sense that because of what you did or because of what happened to you, because of who you are or how you were made and what people maybe told you about that, that you are somehow unfixable, unlovable, and wrong. As researcher and author Brene Brown writes, shame is lethal. Shame is lethal. And today I brought with me to the pulpit the book that we just finished studying in our Wednesday night class by Brene called Daring Greatly. If you're being challenged by shame and your mistakes are holding us back, you're holding you back in life, this is a great book to wrestle with about moving beyond shame and moving forward in life. But she does write that shame is lethal, that shame can kill our futures and leave us with unfinished business in this world, stunting our ability to live, learn, and lead. And that's where we are in today's gospel story because you all know that I am a gospel preacher and I love teaching you about the gospel because today so many people have not heard the story from this perspective. We take the Bible seriously here. But I want to take us right into Peter's shame on a fishing boat in the Sea of Tiberias in this passage. And remember, this is Peter the rock upon whom the church would be built. The Peter whom Jesus had renamed from Simon, son of John, to Simon Peter, or Peter for short. The same Peter whom Jesus astounded with a miraculous catch of fish. Peter the fisher of men, fisher of people. The same Peter who proclaimed Jesus to be the true son of God before any other disciple dared to. This is the same Peter whose mother-in-law Jesus healed. The same Peter who walked on water, who saw Jesus transfigured on a mountaintop. The same Peter who promised to stay by Jesus' side even unto death. The same Peter that some might say was a super disciple until his courage failed so catastrophically around a charcoal fire in the royal courtyard on the night of Jesus' arrest. You know, Jesus could have spent, or Peter could have spent the rest of his life fleeing from that single searing memory of fearfully denying his friend his biggest mistake in life, as he stood a safe distance away as they nailed Jesus to the crucifixion cross. So think about that. Think about where Peter must have been. Even the resurrection event, that Easter resurrection event that we celebrated really just two weeks ago, even that Easter resurrection event couldn't keep Peter from returning to what he knew before he met Jesus. The fishing boat, the salt brine of the sea, the wind on his face, the solitude of his usual vocation, the something familiar that in his comfort zone thing to make him feel safe again. And don't we all do the same thing after danger and stress and tragedy and trauma and grief, we return to the familiar to try and forget, to try and heal. And yet that is not enough. You know why? Do you know why that isn't enough to go back to your comfort zone to heal? Because shame grows exponentially in the dark. You may not know that. Shame grows exponentially in the dark until it can consume your life. And there literally is only one antidote to shame. So, to give credit where credit is due, I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth, Brene Brown, who has made a career of studying this. There is only one antidote to shame. And we're going to play a video as Brene Brown explains the elements of shame and the antidote to this spiritual poison. So, first of all, let's just talk about shame. You've studied it. I did. Not many people have studied it. No. In fact, I wanted to study it, and a lot of people said, no, don't study it, don't study it. 
And then I was kind of a rebel rouser, you know, a little hellraiser. And so I thought, oh, no, then I'm going to study it definitely if I shouldn't study it. And I go to the stacks at the library at our college. And the first article I pull says the decision to study shame has been the death of many academic careers. Oh, my goodness. I was like, student loans, death of the career. I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. You know why? Why? Nobody wants to talk about it. Yes. We have a visceral reaction to the word shame. So you say that if you're, uh, if you're like on an airplane and somebody say, oh, what do you do? And you say, I study shame. People, they, they literally turn the other way. I have answers based on whether I want to chat or not. Yes. And the so answer. I study courage. Oh, yeah. I study shame. Oh, uh, these angry <laughs> birds are fantastic, aren't they? And that's it. Wrap it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the one, two, three is about shame. We all have it. It's the most human, primitive emotion that we experience. How do you define it? The intensely painful feeling that we are unworthy of love and belonging. It's and does devil. it occur after a particular incident or does it occur over, you know, many life experiences? Both. Both. It could, it could happen in an instant. You know, there are specific memories that we can recall that can bring up shame for us but there are also very insidious, quiet messages that we just marinate in over a lifetime. This is what I have always known about and tried to get across to people. And don't think I was successful at it really uh, in the 25 years of the Oprah show. The thing about abuse and particularly sexual abuse, most people think it's about the sex. It's really about the shame that occurs yes. after the sex and it's keeping it the secret and we're only as as liberated as our secrets and the secret creates the shame and you end up feeling like you're a bad person and it's the shame that damages your life the actual act itself people can get over that but it's the shame that you carry with it there is no question in my mind no that that's question truth. about that that's just truth that's just that's like god truth yeah um i think shame is lethal I think shame is deadly. Um, and I think we are swimming in it deep. Do people recognize it no. though? I think people don't recognize so people it. People have one or two reactions when I say shame. They yeah. say, I don't know what you're talking about, but that has nothing to do with me. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I know exactly what you're talking about and I'm not talking about that. <laughs> but here's the bottom line with shame. Mm -hmm. The less you talk about it, the more you got it. it. Shame needs three things to grow exponentially in our lives. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. Yeah. So you put shame in a Petri dish. Yeah. And you douse it with a little secrecy, a little silence, and a little judgment. It grows exponentially. It will creep into every corner and crevice of your life. And shape all of your... Shape everything. Shape everything. The way you think, the yeah. way you think about yourself, the way you think about other people, the way everything. you interact with other people, what you do, the choices you make, who you marry, who you... Do, all of it. Yeah. You put the same amount of shame in a Petri dish and you douse it with empathy. Mm -hmm. You've created an environment that is hostile to shame. Wow. Shame cannot survive being spoken. It cannot survive empathy. So if I call you, if I, something really shaming happens to me. And you talk about it. And I call you and I say, oh God, Oprah, it's Brene. You're not going to believe what happened. I'm in such deep shame. And you say, what's going on? And I tell you, and you express empathy. Yes. Shame can't survive it. Shame has Shame depends on me buying in to the belief that I'm alone. Hmm. You know, I have a good friend, Robert Hilliker, who I work with, and he's a therapist, and he always says, hey, keep the shadow up here, because it can only take you down from behind. Whoa, that's good. Yeah. Here from the horse's mouth, the antidote to shame, you've heard Brene explain what shame is and how it can hold us back, how it can grow in the dark. The antidote to shame, you've also heard, is empathy, love, grace. And that's what today's passage is all about. Now note that the antidote to shame is technically not sympathy because empathy and sympathy are two different things. The antidote to shame is not a minimizing quick fix, like, oh, that, that's not so bad. You don't do that to somebody who's talking about their pain and they're in shame. The antidote to shame is not more alcohol or drugs or fast food or sugar or shopping or cruising. 
The antidote to shame is not denial or blaming others or projecting to your shame onto others and then reacting against that projection. The antidote to shame is really not any of the other inappropriate coping mechanisms that we human beings use to try and cope with our secret shame. The antidote to shame is love. The antidote to shame is love. But to go back to our scripture passage, Peter does not know this out in his boat in the Sea of Tiberias, nursing his guilt and his shame as he fails to even fish successfully that evening, something that he used to do well. You know, there is a richness to this gospel passage, and there is so much that we could cover today, like the miraculous catch of fish that's mentioned, or Peter's jump into the sea when he sees Jesus And when Jesus invites all of the fishermen to the shore where he has prepared a kind of communion meal in his post-resurrection state with bread and fish cooked over charcoal fire. But the critical moment in our gospel lesson today is not about breakfast on the beach with Jesus, no matter how charming that story is, but it is the momentous dialogue between Jesus and Peter. The early church remembered this important encounter because they saw themselves in this exchange, and we should too. Peter spends a long night at sea. Remember, put yourself in this story. He spends a long night at sea trying to catch fish without Jesus, and he fails as he marinates in his own shame. Then dawn breaks, and Jesus shows up, and Peter finds himself on shore with his Savior, breathless and soaked from his leap of faith into the sea as soon as he heard that it was the Lord that was on the beach. And imagine the fear and the humiliation that Peter must have experienced when he was suddenly in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same Lord he had denied in front of the others in that other charcoal fire in the high priest's courtyard. So on this beach, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And three times, Jesus, or Peter responds, Lord, you know I love you. And under his breath, he might have said, Lord, you know I love you, assuming you can overlook that little breach of loyalty when your life was on the line and danger filled the air. So imagine the two of them sitting by that fire on the beach. The acrid smell of the charcoal smoke must have been fresh in Peter's nostrils, just like it was that night he betrayed his friend, with whom he had faithfully ministered together for three life-changing years. And Peter finds himself looking right into the eyes of the Lord he denied not just once, but three times. In the face of triple the shame, Peter faces triple the love questions from Jesus. Three times the shame, three times the love. I ask you to read that passage carefully. It's got three times the shame, three times the love, as Jesus provides a path for Peter's spiritual resurrection from shame. In the words of theologian Debbie Thomas, she writes, What I find both searing and instructive in this story is the way that Jesus saves Peter by returning him to the source of his shame. Jesus does not wrap the humiliated disciple in bubble wrap and gauze. Jesus doesn't avoid the hard conversation. He doesn't pretend that Peter's denials didn't happen and didn't wound because they did. But neither does Jesus preach, condemn, accuse, or retaliate. Jesus feeds. Jesus feeds Peter's body, and then he feeds Peter's soul. He surrounds the self-loathing disciple with tenderness and safety, inviting him to revisit his shame for the sake of healing, restoration, and then recommissioning Peter to heal the world. But Jesus doesn't mince words either. It is interesting in this exchange that Jesus uses Peter's full birth name. You kind of have to know this from the Bible, if you don't, but he uses Peter's full birth name. 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? Because remember, he renamed him Simon Peter, and in in his text he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, how many of you, when you were in trouble as a kid, your parents used your full name, including your middle name? Right? Raise your hand if that happened to you. That's how you knew you were really in trouble, right? Was if your parents used your full name. They tried to make sure you understood the gravity of your misdeed and the seriousness of the instruction that was about to ensue by calling you forth with your full name. And that's what Jesus was doing with Peter. So this was literally Peter's come-to-Jesus moment. Have you heard that expression, a come-to-Jesus moment? Well, this is one of the places it comes from. A come-to-Jesus moment means to have, it's been an overused phrase, but what it really means is to have that reckoning, that honest conversation that confronts what happened, the shame and the guilt, and then how to heal and move forward. It was Howard Thurman who put it this way when talking about coming to Jesus, that no event in your life can imprison you, and that's what the resurrection was all about. But sometimes we have to have a hard conversation to get there as we are called to continually believe that God is not through with our lives or with us no matter what. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how mature you are, how young you are. I don't care what you've done or not done in your life. God is not done with you. Can you give yourselves an amen? I know some of you are sitting with shame and pain and guilt. You're wondering how to move forward. And I'm here to tell you that God's not done. Trust that God's going to keep working in your life. But... In this passage, Jesus doesn't always mince words to get there. He wants to make sure that Peter understands the importance of what he's asking him to do because he recommissions Peter. I'm emotional about this. If you don't know this passage, read it. He recommissions Peter to build God's church in the world in a new way, in a non-judgmental, loving, empathetic, inclusive way. So Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And each time, what was Peter's response? What did he say? Did he say yes or no? Some of you are like, I didn't know there was going to be a pop quiz, but yes, I do do that. Did he say yes or no? He said yes. And after each answer from Peter, Jesus gives the most instruction of all. He said, if you love me, then feed my sheep, even the little ones, the lambs, meaning that there is work to do in the world. It's time to quit fishing, Peter, and it's time to get to work building God's kingdom instead. Stop looking in the wrong places for comfort and start working in the right places for redemption. Meaning, There is the life we have constructed for ourselves, and then there is the life that Jesus is calling us to, and they're not the same thing. They are rarely the same. As theologian Debbie Thomas wrote, Jesus' appearance to Peter, like all of the post-resurrection appearances in the gospel, they speak volumes about God's priorities. In the days following the resurrection, I hope you will note this when you read these passages, in the days following the resurrection, note that Jesus does not waste a moment on revenge or retribution. He doesn't storm Pilate's house or avenge himself on Rome or punish the soldiers who drove nails into his hands. Instead, Jesus spends his post-resurrection appearances, he spends that remaining resurrected time on earth feeding, restoring, and strengthening his friends for future ministry. Think about it. He calls Mary Magdalene by name as she cries. He offers his wounds to the skeptical Thomas. He grills bread and fish in today's scripture for the hungry disciples. Today, he also heals what's wounded and festering between his heart and Peter's. In other words, 
Jesus focuses not on retribution, but on relationship. He focuses not on retaliation, but on reconciliation. He focuses on love. Jesus spends the last days before his final ascension into heaven, delivering his people from fear, despair, self-hatred, shame, and paralysis. He wastes no time on triumphalism or smugness. Even at the height of his power, Jesus chooses humility. He chooses to linger on a lonely beach till dawn to ask Peter an honest and vulnerable-making question about denial, even though the answer may hurt. He asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter's shame meets Jesus' grace, and grace wins. That's the gospel story in a nutshell. Grace wins. Grace wins trumps shame every time. Love wins, shame withers, and life flourishes as we find the grace of yet another day. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we relish the gift of another day to be faithful to you. May we never, ever take for granted waking up in the morning and having another day, especially after having endured the last couple of years. May we remember that Jesus' love healed Peter's shame, and Peter went on to become the fiery preacher of Pentecost and the architect of the birth of the church that we live into today. May we remember that we too are not the sum of our failures and our regrets, but rather we are the multiplication of your love in our lives as we loosen the shackles of the past, fully relish the now, and willingly embrace our spiritual future. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, I hope that you heard in that message a path forward. I hope that you heard something that resonated with you so that you know that you are not defined by the biggest mistakes you've made in life, but rather God's love can heal anything and God is not done with you yet. So I appreciate all of you who are here today, all of you who are watching online because God is not done with you yet and we're here to help you find the way. But we need your help to do it. We've reached the time of our offering We give in grateful for thanksgiving for all that God has given us, including the gift of yet another day. In the upside-down world of the gospel that Jesus left us, we measure our wealth not by what we have, by what we can give away. Let us give generously in this offering. And if you missed a Sunday, I was away last Sunday, catch up. You know, make sure that you're catching up on those Sundays because we need your support. We need your support to bless our church, our people. We need your support to bless this creation and to do what God is calling us to do. May more people hear this message that church should not be about shaming you for your mistakes, but inviting you into relationship with a Christ who redeems. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We have reached the time in our service for our communion litany. And as I mentioned, uh, we are going to share the longer litany today, and then we'll be sharing this again in September. So I invite you to sink into this moment, listen to the words, join me in unison at the appropriate times, and rest into this litany that has been written and rewritten by scholars and theologians to help all of us share communion together. We first confess our sins because if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and follow in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Just as we talked about in today's sermon, anyone in Christ becomes a new person altogether. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever believes in me will never be hungry, and whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. No one who comes to me will I drive away, because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. Please join me in the unison prayer of our faith. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere, and that you remain faithful to your covenant even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered, with your sons and daughters of faith in all places and times. We praise you with joy. Please be seated. On the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, because he always first give, gave thanks in all things, after he had given thanks, Jesus broke the bread, 
And he gave it to those gathered, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And then likewise, on that same night, Jesus took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to those gathered, saying, Take, drink. This is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, the blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And so we have, for thousands of years, along with billions of other Christians, let that sink in for a moment. Please join me in the affirmation of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And to the extent you wonder what that means, if theologically you're struggling with that, just look at today's passage where Jesus came in a post-resurrection appearance to help someone overcome their shame and claim their call to build the church. Think about how powerful that is. But we have to prepare a space for Christ to enter into our lives. You're doing that by being here today, by watching online. You're creating a space for God to appear again in your life so that you can be redeemed and live into your call. Let us pray. Holy One, show forth among us the presence of your life-giving word and Holy Spirit to sanctify us in your entire church through these holy mysteries. Grant that all who share the communion of the body and blood of our risen Savior may be one in Jesus Christ. May we remain faithful in love and hope until the perfect feast with our exalted Savior in the eternal joy of your heavenly realm. Please join me. Gracious God, accept with favor this our sacrifice of praise, which we now present with these holy gifts. We offer to you ourselves giving you thanks for the perfect offering of the only one begotten by you, Jesus Christ, our Savior, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be to you, eternal God, now and forever. Amen. We like to say at communion that this is a place, and I know you all have your Lunchables, I'm going to go get mine in just a moment, but this is a place where no matter what secret, pain, grief, shame, mistake, whatever it might be in your life, whatever might be holding you back, whatever shame you're living with in the dark, you're invited to bring it to this table here and to leave it here because this communion table is a place where we eat and drink hope. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready for you. So do you have your communion lunchables that we've been using during the pandemic? We've had to do things a little differently, haven't we? We've had to learn how to function in different ways, and now we're learning how to adjust to things changing again. So I invite you to take what we've affectionately called the communion lunchables. If you've ever packed a kid's lunch, you know what I'm talking about. I invite you to take the clear wrapper off the top first, to take the wafer, and I get that it tastes a little like cardboard, I get that, but we're not quite ready yet to all be coming forward and consuming you know, the same bread together. So this represents the bread that we've talked about today, the bread of life. I invite you to take this eat and be filled. And then secondly, even though we often would do this by coming forward, it's called by intinction, we would share communion together and begin to circle the sanctuary. We're going to do it just a little differently as we continue with our public safety measures. I invite you to take this cup. And I do get some of you let me know that it doesn't taste like what we normally serve. I get that. But it's representative of what we're sharing, that this is, represents the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. It represents hope and new life. Drink and never be thirsty.
Please stand and join me for the unison prayer of thanksgiving. Bountiful God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please exit the pews as you feel comfortable doing. We are going to circle the sanctuary as is our custom and sing Ubi Caritas or Live in Charity, and the band will get us started. But one of the elements of our communion tradition that we're reclaiming um, as we move forward in life after the last couple of years is that we share communion not just by looking at me, not just by looking at the band, but we share communion by looking at each other because the community matters. Jesus taught us it wasn't just about our relationship with God, although that's important. It's also about our relationship with each other. So I'm going to put the mask on and we are going to sing together. And I don't know if we're able to hold hands or not yet. I don't know where we are with the public health guidelines. Now, I want you all to stretch around because I don't know what's happening over on this side of the church, but this side of the church needs some help. So come on, stretch around. We can circle this sanctuary. You're going to have to stretch just like in life. You're going to have to stretch. Stretch yourselves. Come on, folks, there's enough room. If you all stretch your arms out as wide as possible, come on, make some space. Make some space. Make sure that nobody feels alone or left out. All right, I'll come and fill a space. Yeah, I'll turn my mic off. There. As you leave from this place today, I'm going to stand back here again just to stay safe with my mask off. It is so wonderful and lovely to see all of you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Can you give yourselves a round of applause? Thank you for being here today. Thank you for watching online because we include you in this. But as you leave from here today, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace while you go forth to live the gospel forgiven, redeemed, and free. Thanks be to God. Depart in peace and have a wonderful week. It was wonderful to see you. Thank you.
Try and keep your head up to the sky